Hello, everybody. Bonjour, tout le monde. Um, yeah, I'm also very happy to join this program, this fantastic week we already had. And before we start, I just say, um, Sandra, Sönke, Liam, that's all. That's the three of them sitting here. I would ask you to sit again here because we want to see films, 360 films. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be a bit interactive and spontaneous because normally, you know, when you start talking a lot in the beginning of a session, I think we should actually go directly to the films. We will see two entire 360 for, uh, journalistic pieces, one trailer, and then we will have a discussion all together what we have seen, what feelings, what thoughts, what information you gained. Yeah. So I'm also stop talking. On a rooftop above Fallujah, an Iraqi sniper takes careful aim at an ISIS soldier. He slowly tracks his target, and then... This is Fallujah, Iraq. Nearly 300,000 civilians used to live here. Now, it's a ghost town. Some of the most iconic fighting in the American War happened here in 2004. What remains now is a grim and dusty symbol of seemingly endless violence and despair. My name is Ben C. Solomon. That's me in the front seat. I'm a filmmaker and journalist for the New York Times. Behind me is my collaborator and translator, Motez Majid Mohammed. Together, we spent a month this summer embedded with Iraqi fighting forces as they pushed into the city of Fallujah, which had been under ISIS control for the past two years. The frontline mortar team was calm. It was the second morning since fighting began, and my first trip to the front line. ISIS fighters are close by, only a few hundred meters away. And we weren't sure how well this ragtag unit of the Shia militia, with mismatching uniforms and little organization, could protect us. Motez and I were nervous. Things were quiet. And then suddenly. Gunfire comes in right above our heads. You can hear the zinging of the bullets flying just past. This close fire could mean more attacks are on their way. And the militia flies into action. Here we're about four miles outside of Fallujah. Tanks, artillery, personnel carriers, and thousands of men are all coming together. Soon, we'll advance into the city itself. In America, people talk of ISIS as a distant menace. But here, in this vast and hot desert, 
They are an army. And these are the men sent to fight and kill them. War is a lot of downtime. We spend time with fighters, mostly young men, sitting around, waiting for something to happen. But you never know what's coming. That's an outgoing rocket. These fighters are used to it and get a good laugh out of our reaction. <laughs> For weeks, we've been stuck on the outskirts of the city. By early June, the ISIS forces are weakened. Civilians stream out of the city, and finally, we roll in. This is central Fallujah. ISIS fighters are just a few blocks away. Artillery, jets, and helicopters are all firing down on them. It's an uneasy place to be. with the Iraqi special forces as they fight street by street. Now is the most dangerous part of the fight. The ISIS fighters are making their final stand in the neighborhood of Jolan, the same battleground where Americans fought in 2004. It's a common ISIS tactic, leaving behind a group of fighters whose job it is to fight until the death. Over the next few days, the last ISIS fighters are killed or have fled, and the city is retaken. Iraqi fighters are in the streets, posing for eager local TV stations with a captured ISIS flag, held upside down, a sign of disrespect. The city is quiet and eerie. The only signs of life are a few Iraqi soldiers roaming the streets, investigating what the enemy left behind. These are the cells where ISIS would hold their prisoners. Smaller cages like this one are about the same size as a dog crate. The taller ones are high enough that you can stand, but too narrow to lie down. There's a thick smell lingering in the air. On the floor, bits of meat for the prisoners were still left out. The brutality of the Iraqi forces What you're about to see over the next couple of minutes is the battle. This is was on display as well. On the side of the road there, right under the sun, what appeared to be the body of an ISIS soldier was left in the street. He had been beheaded, his legs were bound, and it looked like he had been dragged by a car. We watched uncomfortably as the Iraqi militia fighters took photos with the body. The 
Iraqi military is in full control. And while the success of the fighting is exciting for many, for the civilians of Fallujah, this is their life now. These are the Fallujah refugee camps, built around 15 miles outside of the city, on the edges of the desert. Nearly 80,000 civilians have come here in the past week. It's nearly 120 degrees each day. There aren't enough tents or containers, so many families must live outside. blows hot sand all around. I have filmed in dozens of refugee camps all over the world, and this was by far the harshest and most unforgiving. So are they happy to be here now? These people had lived under a brutal regime for two years. For the last month of it, they were shelled and bombed regularly. Now, even though the conditions were extreme here, most of them were grateful to be alive. This is heaven. There's food. We've been well fed. The dust doesn't bother us. We've lived under the bombs of airplanes and shelling of mortars. God is gracious. For this woman, called Umm Madhir, and her family of eight, they hope to return to Fallujah when it's safe. For others, like Abu Akil, who was lucky enough to get his family moved to a trailer in the camp, he's lived in Fallujah for all of his life. And enough is enough. In the last 30 years, we have never had security. Never. I want to find a place elsewhere, any place. I've rebuilt my house twice, and this is the third time it's destroyed. Why should I go back? The Iraqis have retaken Fallujah but the fighting in Iraq is far from over. 13 years after the Americans came here, and five years after their last combat troops pulled out, violence and devastation are everywhere. As we ride past the wreckage and empty streets, it's clear that the future is bleak. This city is just one of many broken pieces in this fractured land. to the east of the city, to Port de Vincennes. In the last hour, we've heard that there's been an attack on a Jewish supermarket. Inside that supermarket, we're told the man has two Kalashnikov rifles. There are five hostages, we understand, inside. So a very tense situation here in Paris developing at the moment. Luke. My name is Jean-Luc. I work near Hypercaché. So I thought to myself, right then, I'll pick up some salads for Shabbat tonight. My name is Carol. I have three sons. My husband, he was at home with the boys at the time. There are police herring off to the east of the city, to Port de Vincennes. In the last hour, we've heard that there's been an attack on a Jewish supermarket. Inside that supermarket, we're told the man has two Kalashnikov rifles. There are five hostages, we understand, inside. So a very tense situation here in Paris developing at the moment. My name is Jean-Luc. I work
work near Hypercashi. So I thought to myself, right then, I'll pick up some salads for Shabbat tonight. My name is Carol. I have three sons. My husband, he was at home with the boys at the time. I am Alan Kuhnel. I went to the supermarket to buy hummus. I knew it was at the back of the shop. I heard a loud bang at the entrance and I just knew that's a machine gun. We froze, just standing there watching. Everything happened at the blink of an eye. Then he fired another burst. I thought, not today. I can't let myself die today. My son needs me. Who else will look after him? I turned around and saw a spiral staircase. I raced down, but we were trapped anyway. There were two cold rooms, side by side. So there must have been about 10 of us. Someone came down to the basement a hostage came and told us, go back up, otherwise he'll come down and kill everyone. I didn't know what to do. I thought about going back up. I took the first step. But there was no way I was putting my foot on the next step. I just didn't have the strength to go back up. At that moment, I thought, no, if he, if he wants to kill me, you will have to come and find me. I will not go to him. I didn't want to die in a basement. If this had to be my end, then I'd prefer it happens up in the light. So I told myself, well then, I'll go upstairs then. When I came up out of the basement, I saw him at the back of the shop with his Kalashnikov. I thought he might fire at anyone he sees. So I asked straight away, is it okay if I come in? What he said next was somehow weird. Please do come in, monsieur. Oui, venez, monsieur. I heard another two shots and didn't know what had happened. So I was down there, all alone. I saw someone holding the cold room door open, and I said, wait, don't close the door. Wait, wait, wait. The moment the door closed, it was pitch black. I just had one thought. He'd come down and kill us all. He'd finished the job he started up there, down here. There were lots of cardboard boxes and I hid behind them. There were six of us, three men, three women, plus the baby. We thought we should be able to hear if he would come down. So we kept quiet. No one said a word. Everyone sat terrified in their own corner. The woman on the ground, whose coat got wet. The baby. It was freezing cold. My daughter called me, three times. I didn't answer. I cried, 
because what was I supposed to say to her? Goodbye? Adieu? Have a nice life? I couldn't say that to my daughter. I prefer to leave this world without saying anything. Because right then, I didn't think any of us thought we would make it out alive. <laughs> One after another, he asked us to introduce ourselves. He asked each one of us, name, age, profession, origin. I hesitated on origin. I didn't know what he meant. No one had ever asked me that before. I didn't know how to answer, so I just said, French? Then he prompted me, Catholic? And I said, yes. Catholic. The magnitude of what happened in that moment is far greater than the event itself. Its significance runs deeper, much deeper. It's even more horrific by asking who you are. He's saying, I'm going to kill you because you are a Jew or a Christian. It was a racist question and a clearly racist act. C'est un acte, c'est une demande clairement raciste. In the cold room, we heard the metal shutter come down, the shop being locked up. We were trapped inside. I was glued to my phone until the battery died. It was hell when the battery was dead. No more contact with my family, with anyone. And then at the end, I think there was just one last phone that was still in contact with the police, but we felt like they didn't know what to do. And we were waiting and waiting. We were freezing. You see your life flash before your eyes. You think to yourself, this is it, this is the end. You think of your children, your family, you, you wonder how it came to this. How can this even be happening? We're hiding because we're Jews? I thought things like that were in the past that I'd never experienced anything like that. And not when you've just popped out to do some shopping. no sense of time. We weren't there for five hours, waiting for death. Red et euh, la BRI décident d'intervenir. A l'aide d'explosifs, ils vont faire voler en éclats les vitres de la supérette et donner l'assaut. Ils tuent donc le preneur d'otage et euh, parmi les policiers, on compte donc trois policiers. On en ressort un peu cassé. You feel broken afterwards. Fatigué. Exhausted. Mais on se relève. But you pick yourself up and think, at least I made it, I'm still here. Others weren't so lucky. I was filled with a terrible feeling that still hasn't left me. I was going to be killed for things I can do nothing about, just because of who I am, because I was born different. I'm thankful to be alive, to be among the living. I saved myself, not that I have any idea how. It could have ended very
bit differently. I could have been one of the four victims. Au clair de la lune, mon ami Pierrot, prête-moi ta plume pour écrire un mot. Ma chandelle est morte, je n'ai plus de feu. Ouvre-moi ta porte pour l'amour de Dieu. In Frankreich überschlagen sich die Ereignisse. Wait for something that isn't going to happen. Come with me on a deep journey to the most remote areas of our world. The Democratic Republic of Congo is staging the deadliest conflict since World War II. In order to enter the Lonesome Kingdom of a Warlord, we have to overcome many obstacles. We are at the point of no return. Our goal is to learn about the life of the women in the middle of the Congolese jungle. Once in, you cannot unknow the information anymore. The 360 experience enables you to look around and see for yourself what is going on in this no-go area. Come and sit with Justine, immerse yourself with her reality. Come and have a walk in a country you've probably never heard of. Transistria has its own parliament, its own police, president, military, and even its own currency, but no international recognition. Europe's last hammer and sickle state could be the first war scenario with Russia on European ground. Visit a country that officially does not exist, Meet people who know everything about us and help them to be invisible no more. Dive into the deeper means of an unconventional encounter. We find ourselves on a cargo plane somewhere over a desert. Regular passenger planes are not reaching out into this area. Other people are not as lucky as we are. Coming here is dangerous and exhausting, but you now have the chance to lighten up this forgotten conflict and encounter the situation of the Nubans. Observe firsthand the struggle of the Nubans against their own government. Experience it yourself. Somewhere in Chile, we are entering the former sect Colonia Dinagad. Hundreds of people came voluntarily here to build the ideal society, living from their own work in a just community. After a short while, electronic fences were built and the inhabitants became step-by-step -step prisoners of a ruthless leader. Sit down with the former sect member. 
How did the people live getting tortured and being locked up for decades in this frightening parallel universe? Discover for yourself. Praktisch nie ein Wort geredet, das war verboten. After a long and dusty journey to the other side of our world, we seem to enter an echo of another time. Thousands, hundreds of thousands had to leave their homeland, South Sudan. They came to stay. The refugees build up a state in a state far away from their home. Stand in front of Vaiki, face her situation and listen to her story. Our aunties, elders have been killing. That's why we fear them. So we are here. Testify the exodus. Be the witness. Use the unique opportunity to dig into a world you would never experience otherwise. Blended isolations redefines the idea of political understanding and provides a chance to experience yourself, the planet that we call our world. So I would ask every one of you again back to the stage. Um, so it's it's kind of strange now to speak again because it was, it's three quite heavy pieces we have seen. Um, just to know who is sitting here, um, Sandra Rodriguez is now in this Good to Mentor program, uh, a mentor as well. Mm -hmm. She's in her background. She um, she did a lot of new media projects and she was involved, for instance, in Do Not Track. And you're recently at, you're now teaching at the Open Doc Lab in, at MIT. Um, Sönke, he's an execute, and yeah, you're based now, you're based in in, in uh, Sandra, you're based in Montreal normally. Uh, no, 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 sorry. But I don't, where do you live now, actually? <laughs> I live partly in Montreal, partly you want me to use yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So I'm not Christiana. <laughs> the, the, there was a Christiana here I'm standing in, if I understand correctly, for her. And her question was, do you care about VR nonfiction? I said, actually, I work at I Still Film in Montreal, where I'm the head of creative reality or immersive uh, projects that we're doing. And I Still Film is documentary. So all we do is nonfiction. So that's exactly what we're doing. Partly I'm at MIT, where we're working at the MIT Open Documentary Lab. So that, again, is about the future of nonfiction. So how can we imagine other futures for other ways of expressing the real, in a nutshell? Yeah, that's very good. And Sönke, he's an executive pro uh, producer and CEO of InVR in Berlin. It's a Berlin-based company uh, being involved in stereoscopic filming since many years, I think almost 15 years. And actually, when you do VR projects in Germany, uh, normally you're somehow always getting connected to Sönke's um, company and his uh, wonderful team. And Liam, uh, I'm very happy that I got to know you t in these days because I really love your work and I'm very, it's, I'm very touched actually about all your thoughts you have. Liam is a documentary photographer. He is also he has been to all those places. By the way, also Sönke, he did a lot of not only this piece where I think you didn't travel with. I don't know, did you go with uh, Julia? No. She was taking all the footage, but you have also your experience to, to uh, go into these regions of crisis, war, 
and uh, devastation. And Liam, you are actually you're also kind of a war photographer in in your history, but I would say it's more a documentary photographer. And you're also doing artworks, which uh, I think is a good uh, way also to investigate um, this work you're doing. And we just, I don't know who attended the, the panel before. Um, you could see that he's really taking now thoughts what to do with all the material, which was actually not taken by him as a photographer, but t taken by civil uh, civil journalists, more or less, as so a people from the uh, from the society society living in uh, Syria um, and it's not the journalists talking here and sending material but it's really the people living there uh, uploading their um, their footage they witness so um, we have seen three three uh, 360 VR programs definitely it's not so good to have them on that screen I apologize for being not very good in steering but um, uh, yeah, the best way to consume it is always uh, with um, in stereoscopic, and yeah, at least you should always wear um, headphones because they give you more this sense of immersion. Um, so I would like to ask you, because you know those projects more uh, differently, and, but what what do you think was the idea to go out there and do it in VR? So who, you want to start maybe with. Ben Solomon's project. Oh, you have a microphone. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, ben Solomon's project is um, a lot of people touted it as one of the more daring pieces of 360 uh, reportage that's that's been made, um, and it's it's certainly very engaging. Uh, it also received a lot of criticism. Um, some people said it was too flashy, uh, or that this was not an appropriate way for for people to engage in these types of situations. Uh, some people accused the filmmaker of uh, thrusting readers or viewers into traumatic situations from which they couldn't really escape. Um, and these are all concerns that we have in the VR universe. Um, but there was a quote from Ben uh, that I thought was particularly pertinent to this. I'll just read it. Um, he said, uh, you look at the pictures that New York Times photographer Brian Denton shot. Every picture he took, I was standing next to him in Fallujah. A lot of those pictures were really dramatic and powerful. He could make decisions. Whereas with VR being in the middle, this crazy thing is happening in front of you, and sometimes the guy next to you is eating a banana, and the guy behind you is on his phone. So suddenly, this thing that is unbelievably dramatic and terrifying in VR is kind of whatever. Um, and we all know that photographers choose their frame. Uh, Brian, the photographer that Ben's talking about, is a friend of mine, and um, his ethics are beyond reproach. But um, I, I wonder if this is something that we could talk about a little bit, about, uh, you know, whether, because we just sort of plant this device down and, and let it roll, uh, whether that gives us more or less... Um, control over over the image and over the story so what what do you think for instance well uh, so i'm a little i'm jumping here so again i'm like apologizing for not uh knowing what christiana would say <laughs> but i'm going to say what i'm saying and from my standing point i'm going to be a little provocative maybe with this so i actually like a lot the flight for fallujah for th 360 video and journalism um, that's an example I show a lot too, um, because I was surprised to watch it on Facebook on a 360 stream and watch the whole 10 minutes. And you're thinking 10 minutes of attention is a lot of, of time for a movie. Are you crazy? That's so little. It is, but it's a lot of attention time for social media, uh, for only one piece of content. What struck me was context. So contrarily to other images where all, you know, you've probably all seen these images where all the reporters are filming um, a scene that is, you end up seeing that child, let's say in that Syrian uh, refugee camp. You see that child and then you see the counter picture where you have 10 photographers taking that picture and sometimes staging the pictures. Uh, for me, the flight for Fallujah was exactly e seeing the guy smiling in the banana and seeing three reporters running to film the moment where they get shot at and everybody's smiling was exactly the opposite of suddenly it becomes whatever. It suddenly becomes truth. 
There is a context that is drawn out, and that was what I thought was most interesting about this piece. The fi the f uh, so you didn't because it's 360, you cannot choose where people are looking at. Um, but what I liked is the moment where they're all laughing at the journalist reactions. You can actually scroll and look at the journalist reactions, and they look like they just, you know froze, saw a ghost, their faces are like this, and you scroll back and you see the others laughing their heads off. So for me, that context is super important for 360 video. Yeah, and maybe that's one of the benefits is that, that transparency that you're referring to. Um, uh, ben chose to stay present in the shots. Early on, when 360 video was, was a, a new thing, news organizations uh, went to great lengths to conceal the fact that they were reporting uh, in the field. Uh, so they would set up a camera and then like run out of the frame or hide behind a, a rock or whatever um, so that nobody knew there was actually a reporter there, which seems to me absurd. Um, and I, so I really like Ben's um, decision to be transparent about the process. Um, and, and I think that's also part of the allure of the videos that people want to see how this works. Um, it's, there's sort of a lot of mysterious you know, smoke and mirrors about how journalism in conflict zones works, um, and the, and a lot of braggadocio, and uh, this didn't have that. Um, maybe, Sanke, when you see this film, when we talk once more about this Fallujah film, but also the others, um, what do you think about proximity and distance? Because I think when you're under the goggles, something, you have another relation to... to um, distance actually so what what do you think is this good or not or is there maybe yeah i mean <clears throat> in all these pieces that we've seen there or at least the Fallujah thing that we're talking right now um about um i mean of course you need some distance in a way but on the other side um it is meant that people have the feeling that they are there that they 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 um realize what's happening there and how fast it can go so um um, I think it was in that case too much distance would not help out to 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 tell that kind of story in a way. So, and is it you know the the people shown here isn't that very intimate? Is that correct? Um, I sometimes have a problem um, to be so close to people because I would even if I come too very close to you, you would feel uncomfortable. Well, I feel very comfortable because she because she joins us spontaneously, <laughs> um, but. Uh, what do you think? What, what is happening there? Did anyone witness this kind of, oh, in reality, I would never get that close to that person? Well, is this ethical? Um, it's a, I think that your question that you're asking is a super good question, and it brings me back to don't throw the baby out with the water. When people say um, VR, nonfiction, is totally different from the past, actually, whenever I see... Uh, what we call sometimes VR nonfiction, I go like, Whoa, we've just been back like 30 years of documentary filmmaking or just thrown out of the window because suddenly it becomes a news report, which is okay. It's still nonfiction, but there still are different approaches to storytelling. So for instance, proximity, too close, too far. Um, the piano music that always accompanies some of these videos and the voiceover. I'm like, okay, we've been through this. There's other ways to tell stories. Good counter examples for me the, uh, about all these questions of proximity or distance or, are good ethical questions, definitely. But a lot of the times the ethical answer comes from your relationship to the protagonists. And that is where the proximity becomes voyeuristic or a play, just like you, you come close. If I'm not, you know, wanting to, that's a little bit too close. But if I'm inviting you in this world, it's different. So another counter example from the New York Times is the displaced. So the displaced is a 360 video, similar approach, emotional kids who have been displaced because of a war or crisis. But the three kids, you're very close to them. And they decided to just follow the, whatever the kids were and wanted to put the camera. So instead of saying, if you're too top down, it's going to be feeling like, um, like uh, you're being watched or surveilled. Or if you're too tall, it means the characters are lower than you. So you're discriminating them. There's a moment where you're 
you're the camera because that's what you are on a stick and there's a child driving a bicycle and looking at you. And I thought, yeah, I get to be a camera. I don't get to be a voyeur. I get to be invited by this kid to take part into his bicycle ride. So I think the dynamic is as important as where you put the camera to answer that ethical question. I'm not sure if I'm making being clear, but meaning the relationship with your protagonist is what will tell your ethical answer. If you're too close, too far, too high up, too, or too low down. It all depends if you're respecting them and, and inviting them to be part of the story. Yeah. Um, what do you, because we were just talking about sound. Um, well, you said it's... We have seen that, we have done that. But is sound working differently in VR? And actually, I don't know where Eugenie is, but we had once, I would like to put one up one slide, and I would need Eugenie, who is in the back there. <laughs> That's good when you have a microphone. You can make people run. Um, yeah, so what, what is different when you have sound in VR and on a classical documentary? I think there is a difference, is there? Who wants to answer? Well, I think the audio, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert on this, but I, I think the audio is meant to nudge you in certain directions and, and guide you through the scene. I mean, when you're, when you're suddenly thrust into this 360-degree environment, um, you don't always know where to look. Uh, and so you depend on these audio cues to, to orient yourself uh, to the story. Um, but you can also mess with people or make people uncomfortable using that... Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that a certain level of discomfort when you're reporting on certain types of issues is uh, necessary. I don't, I don't know what you think about that. I'm, I'm thinking about it right now. I, I mean, of course, sound is important. I don't think that we have to elaborate on the question how to guide the viewer in a 360 environment by using sound. Um, in documentaries, I think it, it really depends on what you do with it. Because, like... Um, for Julia, the intention, the, the woman who did this one, was uh, the intention to just, she, she shot most of it very static, for example, and she wanted to leave it to the user where he looks at and perhaps watches it like three times and um, um, sees something different if he turns around next time. So she doesn't want to, um, to guide the viewer too much with, with sound triggers on the one hand. On the other side... Um, Of course, we're talking with her about uh, how to continue that, and um, I think the approaches will be probably different than they have been this time. Um, this one um, happened more or less by accident. She wanted to experiment with that camera, but she was there as a photographer, and then she placed the camera somewhere, and then when she came back from the first uh, travel, she recognized what's the impact of the, of the content, and then she took the camera more and more with her. So... Um, I think in the first shooting she didn't even think about um, what's a spatial recording or what could be done with spatial audio. But I doubt that in the next project it will be used. Okay. And so that would lead me actually also to a topic uh, I would, because I, I just put on this, this slide because I think it's important to have in mind that there's a lot of uh, aspects, aspects we all know from filmmaking, uh, and there are some other aspects being added, and they all work together. And here I'm only... Uh, I just have a list of aspects I would look at uh, at a VR program, which is non-fictional filmmaking. And maybe if it was gaming, it would be a complete other uh, slide behind uh, you. Um, so, um, dramaturgy. Um, I think, um, because I always hear, um, also my colleagues now, we are discussing a lot in Strasbourg what now the next step should be for us as we are producing VR films since... Uh, 214, uh, what should be the next step? And then often, ah, no, it's an experience. No, it's a storytelling. No, it's an experience. No, it's an ex storytelling. So actually, I, especially the, the, the thing uh, about um, um, uh, hostages in, in uh, Paris, in the supermarket, I think there's a lot of storytelling and experience. So what would you, would you answer? What is the good answer if your CEO, your program director always just tell you, uh, we should make experiences. It's not for story. 360 is not for storytelling. That's what I get to say very often. And especially when we have topics like the ones we just saw, um, we always have big discussions if we should have it in our um, 360 app. What could I argument <laughs> if you choose to have a 360 video or if you choose to have 
immersive experiences that are not 360 video? Well, I just want to say that many times I get the answer, ah, oh, it needs to be an experiment and we do storytelling and it doesn't work in 360. Does storytelling work in 360? Everything works in 360. Let me do uh, the little exercise I <laughs> Thank did you. this morning. Yes. Go for the, it. <laughs> the little exercise I did this morning uh, with the group VRRV. We are five mentors and we're kind of asked to have, what is your go-to? And whenever we're told virtual reality allows you not to think in frames, I think, wow, you mean like a human? Like, because humans don't think in frames, right? No human ever thought in frames. Frame is the output of a visual grammar that pertains to a medium, just as radio is another medium, just as theater could be a medium, just as the circus could be conceived as a medium. So if you understand that the output is the frame, in this case, 360 video or animation or computer generated images are the output, but a child imagination. So this morning I was trying to bring back the four-year-old in us because I like four-year-olds Bring back the four-year-old and try to think, if I'm telling you a story, do you think about frames? And I'm pretty sure the four-year-old will not describe frames. They describe a world around them. So if I'm telling you fiction, that's an easy to imagine. But what if, what if I'm telling you what happened to me, my personal real story? How do you envision it? Do you also see frames? Do you see sometimes patterns, animation? You were saying this morning that you were trying to express the a multiplicity of stories, but you thought of an image, and that image was a tree and an olive tree. So my question to you would be, when you hear about all these stories, and somebody, somebody asks you, close your eyes, what do you see? That's also documentary. Yeah, I, I don't think that news organizations should feel restricted in the way they tell stories um, to the format of 360 video, which is, you know, the most, uh, it has the, the fewest ethical considerations of any way of, of making a VR experience, I think, because it's, you know, ostensibly it's just, we got a bunch of cameras, we set them up, they roll, and this is what happened. Um, when you start making decisions, um, when you start making creative decisions or choose to interpret a story in a more conceptual way, I think that there are a lot of um, pratfalls and risks, uh, but I think, I think more news organization, organizations should be taking those risks because um, it's a lot more interesting. And there are a lot of different entry points to stories and 360 video is not the only one. So um, when you say there should be more, um, I think there's always a limit in distribution of those videos. Um, and sometimes I have the feeling there needs to be a context somewhere. So I, I personally prefer 360 videos together with an article and to have a full experience. Would you agree? Because sometimes you, know, you fall into this video, you don't really know what the background was. And yeah, and you're in the middle of something which maybe yeah, for uh, sure. shocks you. For sure, for sure. I mean, context is everything, and, and you can make people feel a certain way um, in an immersive environment, but uh, you can't necessarily transfer all of the information that a good uh, piece of reportage will transfer. And I think it's really important to have a balance there. Uh, one is not a substitute for the other. Yeah, I would say it depends a little on the, on the genre, on the format, but if we're talking about non-fictional things, non-fictional 360 video or VR, um, I think it always helps um, if it's a journalistic thing to dive deeper into the topic. Um, I think most of the people who are watching these videos are watching it because they, they have been reading about it or have been guided somehow to, to this topic and found this kind of video. So, um, and I doubt that many people watch these kind of films without being interested in that beforehand or having any, any information about this topic. Um, fictional, I don't know, I would say for fictional pieces you won't have to read the book even if it's a cinema film, so why should you for a, for a VR experience? So. Um, actually, I think I would like to go back. Yesterday you said, um, because you have been traveling a lot to those places and you were asked to do quite a lot of those kind of, you know, refugee camp footage in 360 for the UN and other non-profit organizations because they are one of the 
it's actually not, uh, for instance, us as broadcaster, New York Times did a great work, but if you just look around, there is not so much uh, 360 videos on those topics within the broadcasting system. Um, and you said somehow we did so many of those 360 videos. Would you continue? Because somehow you said, oh, I'm, I'm done. Of course, you're personally also, I heard, personally, it's a bit too much, but... Um, yeah, what, what do you think? Because it, what does the UN say? say what, what makes them ask you to do another piece? Oh, I don't know. I think because they, they have the feeling that they communicate their topics a little bit better like that. And I, I wouldn't say it's a UNICEF, perhaps them as well. Of course, there are always people who just want to play around with a new medium because just because of the new medium it gets some attraction. That could be a reason. Um, uh, but I wouldn't say that's a UNICEF reason, though, or for, for other NGOs. Um, what I personally mean, I think, like, all the people who are doing these kind of projects, being in, in these areas or being in the editing room, uh, most of them are doing that because they are... they they feel that it's important to communicate these stories and to <clears throat> bring these images to people, to an audience that perhaps um, perhaps know about the topic but don't know too much about that. So, um, and all of us, I think, always we talked about that a lot during the last days. Of course, all of us have the hope that people who are not educated on that topic will watch it. The reality is somehow different, I would say. Um, but of course, still we have the hope that people who don't know about the topic watch this piece and start reacting. Um, so, but if you're doing these kind of things, um, and again, it's, um, it doesn't matter if you're, or personally, I would say for me, it doesn't matter if it's just in the editing room or if it's hands on in the field. Um, when you're there, you always have the feeling, I don't want to see that at all. I don't want to be here at all. Um, but, um, it takes you depending on the images that you took and so on, uh, it takes you a while. And then you have the, the inner, you have the feeling that you have to go out there again. And, and, you know, there are so many stories out there and humanity is making new stories each day in, with this context that there is a new conflict or something going on where you have the feeling that has to be reported, that has to be communicated, and then you don't stop yourself too much. But somehow, sometimes I'm getting, um, yeah. There, there is some evidence, though, that um, 360 videos have a higher level of engagement um, Do they still now after some years? Because well, I don't know there. if it's the you know the novelty factor or what, but but by engagement I mean after they finish watching the piece or watching half the piece or however much of the piece they watch, there is this tendency for viewers to go and Google what they were just seeing and try and find out more about it, um, which is encouraging. <coughs> so there is another there is a form of impact that people stake. Would you agree? Uh, do you have um, well, actually? Do you have data? Do we? Is there any data about the impact of those videos? Ah, uh, that. So um, hmm, I'm thinking. I have three questions, three answers at once. But I'm going to try with first. <laughs> uh, the first is just um, yeah, bringing it back to your comment, uh, which I think is interesting. Again, so we talk about nonfiction, but a lot of the times the fallback mode is think about virtual reality for nonfiction as journalism and video. And so that is one uh, way to do it. And when you were saying, we don't want to be in that space. So recently, um, the last two years have been working parallelly on two projects uh, with I Still Film. One of them is called Big Picture. The idea is it's for the United Nations. It's about the use of data and humanitarian crisis. So again, they were wanting a 360 video because they feel currently that's the thing they have to have. So we had a hard time convincing them that how do you talk about data with a video? It's kind of hard. So yes, we shot in northeastern Nigeria, where part of a huge crisis is happening right now, but that's a data hole. And so the rest of the video was showing every types of data that they're streaming, and we used animation for that. So the, the format can change from using video and overlaying layers of animation and interactivity. So the user actually is, uh, has a, where you're watching is where you see some data appear and you can kind of understand the relationship between the gas station you're at and what, how that affects the way a crisis is solved. So again, they were surprised that we wanted to film 
gas stations, people in Lagos exercising in parks, um, uh, people at the shopping mall uh, listening to music on, you know, on their head, headphones. And they said, but no, don't you want to be in a camp? And I, again, I kept thinking, you're looking for a news report about a camp, but the topic is use of data in a humanitarian crisis. And the data that they're receiving comes from people connecting with their loved ones all around the country, not from the camp. So we need to show Lagos, we need to show Nigeria as one of you know, the African continent's most connected uh, country, but also one of the world's most connected countries. And we forget about that. So we need to show that first and foremost. So the discussions between what the UN wanted was also driven by what they feel the audience is ready for. And when you show something different to talk about nonfiction, you'd be surprised about their reaction. Now, in parallel, not wanting to be there, um, we have that problem to talk about manic depression. So we have a documentary called Manic about manic depression. People's reaction was, I don't want to be inside the head of a manic depressive. So again, the first go-to is be someone else or be a place you could never be before. And we thought, but that, why would that be it? That's like a false claim for this project. The project is not about being in a manic depressive minds. It's about inviting a manic depressive to let you see what his or her's imagination is driving as a creative world. So that is totally different as a selling point, and it's still documentary. So that's, I don't, I'm not wanting to take the floor, but I mean, it is hard to kind of sometimes imagine nonfiction being something other than putting a camera and that is it. But the idea is the medium has affordances that um, other mediums don't have. For instance, physical presence, not presence of feeling you are there because you can look around, but maybe even moving into that space. So how do you explore other spaces and other affordances to talk about subject matters where you're saying, I wouldn't want to be there, but do you, would you want to listen to their stories? And if so, maybe sound is going to drive your story. Or if you're saying, I don't want to be there, but I want to see how they're imagining a better world, well, maybe that's what you need to show. There was a, a well-known study conducted by Stanford University in 2011 with uh, early VR uh, in which participants were asked to cut down a tree virtually. Um, and after, after they did that, um, there was a test, there was a study group and a test group. And so they were both monitored for their use of paper products. And the people who had virtually cut down a tree used significantly less paper products after they'd seen the piece. So I don't know what that says exactly, but <laughs> there's an yeah. impact. So actually, you just named now it's the psychological effect of those experiences. Um, and yeah, because we are normally in, in this journalistic context, I think we wouldn't normally call a psychologist maybe we have a friend and we would ask him to word. Did you ever thought about working together with a psychologist? Because I think that's, did you ever do that? Yeah. For instance, Sanke, everyone who did projects? Yeah, that's different projects and different approaches where psychologists come into, uh, into projects for us. It's like... Um, but in journalism, I just, I, I would like to stick a bit uh, in journalism. In the journalism field, yeah, of course, like in, um, if it's on post um, traumatic, uh, how is it called in English? Post traumatic? Tra trauma. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. P so um, these PSD, kind of projects. No? Um, PDS. Post-traumatic stress what we're talking about. Um, it's, um, uh, of course, first you have to understand what's the problem about, so you have to talk to psychologists um, about all these things, and um, you can't just go talk to the people without knowing what's, uh, what's the problem, what's the issue. So, of course, that's one, one example of many that I would have. Yeah, yeah we, we actually, especially for the project uh, Manic, we talk to psychiatrists, um, psychiatrists both here at the Douglas Hospital in Montreal, but also psychiatrists researching brain waves and how uh, mental health disorders affect the patterns in the, in, the, in the brain scans. And we thought about that to influence music. So the way the brain connects on during a hypomania, mania, uh, psychosis, or depression, we started seeing with psychiatrists, are these patterns that are 
specific to an individual or are repetitive. And it actually changed even what we wanted to say in the story. We started with a single documentary material, which are recorded sound bites of um, the director's brother and sister who are both manic depressive and call her in phases of hypomania, mania, psychosis, depression to explain what they're seeing. So that is one thing. We have that as a document. That's the documentary. But then the reality of the, the rest that we wanted to explore with the imagination, we were um, told by uh, psychiatrists, uh, be really, really, really careful. The worst thing you could do is make, a do make any documentation of one individual and let people feel that that is manic depression. Manic depression is not that person's story. It is so close to the individual's imagination the thing you need to bring attention to is the cyclical nightmare. And so we thought flip of what we want to talk about in documentary. It's no longer about only their imagination. It's the cyclical, the cycle nightmarish cyclical ups and downs that accompany the disorder. That is now the topic of focus. So I'm, it's important to see how it impacts the, the user or visitor as well. Uh, you don't want to, the, the experience to trigger anything for that person, in particular if you're talking about mental health. So asking about uh, research being conducted right now on the potential uh, neurological impacts um, that could be triggered, that is a Pandora box because there's currently very, very little research done except for place cells and understanding how that affect your place cells in your brain. Yeah. So that's a whole other topic. Yeah, and we know, especially also teenagers, they, when they're 14, they're, the, the whole brain is rewired, actually. And when you watch a lot of VR, VR games, whatever, uh, that can have a big impact. Um, before opening to the panel, because there are so many people, and maybe you have questions. Um, one aspect I was a bit, I had difficulty so far, finding reviews about VR pieces not games, but also because we are talking now in the context of journalism. So is there journalism about VR journalism? And should we learn to write about it? Is there any, because yeah, sometimes it's so, I, I did, couldn't find very much about it. Do you know anything? Uh, well, when, when uh, Fight for Fallujah was, was released, um, and it was right around the time that the New York Times had uh, accompanied uh, their Sunday magazine with uh, a Google Cardboard. And the public editor at the time, uh, what's her name? Um, Maureen Tomey? Margaret Sullivan. Um, she's the former public editor of the New York Times. And um, she wrote this piece about what viewers could expect and kind of broke it down and, and um, did a little review. And then closed with this great line, um, think outside the cardboard box. Um, and I think that's what the New York Times is trying to do here, and I think that's what a lot of journalistic outlets should try and do, is, is think beyond what's been made and, and think about ways to move forward. Um, and maybe, yeah, so maybe, you know, writing about VR is not a bad thing because it can encourage people to explore new dimensions. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything from Germany or Europe? As you ask me right now, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, s um, say one article or something that is journalism on VR journalism, but um, I have the feeling there's tons of things out there and um, there is as well journalism on journalism or, um, or I mean, journalism um, could cover like um, Fachpresse, like, like um, something like this as well. So that's there definitely and it's, in, it's there in Germany as well. But as a medium is relatively new right now as we have it right now, not going back to this word of Damocles and um, these um, um, first attempts, um, but with this new medium, it is so new that I have the feeling it just needs some time and then we will have much more there. It's just due to that fact um, on the one hand. So what Obviously, when you ask this question, what comes to my mind is, yeah, there is, but mostly it is either the lovers or the haters, um, much more emotionally than what I would expect from a journalist in a way right now. But there are articles, for sure. I'll search that uh, after the panel. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Send the links to me, because I actually, I think it's very crucial also to get the, the cultural practices with this medium, so that it's not only VR is the message, but, yeah, so... Would you encourage me to find journalists? Is there any journalist here? 
Yeah, so well, I don't know, maybe uh, we could also open now, the, it's the moment also good to open a panel, because I think it's, for me, that's a question which just came to me, because when you say it's so, such a new medium, that's not true, it's some years now, come on. Yeah, but uh, compared to radio yes. or cinema, where you find tons of articles and about the history of that, I think um, compared to that, it's relatively new. I'm totally on your page. The medium is not that new that everybody could say like, oh, it's, um, we don't know anything about it and we just make ex experiments. I think that phase is over, more or less, but now the film schools can start to educate people on the medium. I, I was going to suggest a reference, maybe uh, immerse.news, if any of you have been checking out this medium uh, platform. So uh, on the medium platform, pardon, immerse.news is a webzine uh, that's being uh, curated by... Uh, Partly Tribeca, the MIT Open Doc Lab, uh, Sundance. And so it is news journalism about VR. So not just about VR news. So it's not just news about VR news. Uh, but of course, a lot of them are documentarian. So there's a lot about how do you represent the real in VR. So it's getting closer, I guess. But I, but I was going to say also, bear in mind that a lot of innovative uh, VR journalism or nonfiction journalism is not necessarily always seen on YouTube 360 or New York Times 360. Sometimes it's also displayed as installations and sometimes it's displayed in festivals. So the reviews or journalists that review the festival's programming also look at it. I'm thinking in particular about 16 by 9 or 9 by 16, 16 by 9. 16 by 9. Um, so The Guardian, The Guardian is about present at every documentary festival that we're at. I'm like looking at Louis Richard from NFB uh, in the audience, but I think The Guardian has been present at every festival uh, that we may see documentaries at. And they're always really, really innovative in their approach. And I think The Guardian understood something about the audience. As you were saying, if they've watched something like this, they want to see more. So their idea is not to tackle a topic with immersive explorations. It's rather... Think about how that medium may allow you to unravel a new part of that reality. So if you're talking about mass incarceration or isolation in our incarceration, they'll have a series of articles about incarceration. They'll have some videos about it that you can also click into. They'll have interactive website. And then there's this installation slash 360 experience in computer generated images where you can be inside The, the, the life, the head, and the imagination of multiple people who have lived inside 16 by 9 feet incarcerated space. So it kind of unravels kind of a Lego box. And they say, you know, you want to understand that situation? Well, this is an article. These are some interviews and videos. This is for you to dig more content. And here is how you can experience it for yourself. So I think it's another way to understand the place and the audience for such experiences. Yeah, I would completely agree. Uh, so. With one caveat, I mean, if you spend five minutes in a 16 by 9 virtual space, that's nothing whatsoever like the actual experience of being in solitary confinement for weeks or months on end. Um, and I think it's important that people make that distinction when they're using those, those methods to make people feel something or to feel an experience or to feel what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. If you walk five minutes uh, in the shoes of a, of a migrant who's you know, being smuggled through Bulgaria to um, Western Europe, uh, that doesn't mean you really have any idea what their experience is like. It's just a taste. And, and I think we can't confuse those, those things. Yeah, so virtual reality is not the reality. Yeah. So is there um, questions, remarks, <laughs> provocations? Hello. Hello. Uh, as we all know, technology evolves and um, these days everybody can make music because it's easier. These days everybody can be or is a photographer as it is easy to make photos with your camera, films. I was just wondering with uh, the 360 filming, do we lose something? Because back, back in the days, you had to focus on one frame. You, uh, the, the magic was, okay, take this frame of this scene, take this 
picture, go closer there, frame out, frame in. These days, the user can do everything. So are we kind of losing kind of an art there? And do you also think maybe if you are a documentary guy or a woman uh, doing a documentary, it's, it's easier because you just take the camera with you and you don't have to focus on one scene because it's the decision of the, yeah, of the, of the, of the person who's watching it. My answer would be, would be no uh, in, in all these questions because on the one hand, um, you're gaining something else. It's a new medium, so you just have to think differently and so you can do things that you can't, couldn't do before. On the one hand, on the other side, you, you gain things that, or you, you lose things, of course. Like when DOPs from a 16 by 9 world come to um, ask us, like, um, um, what's the difference? Um, normally, they always have things in mind, like like what you do with framing, like um, um, having close-ups and stuff like that. What you normally don't have in VR, of course, people can come close, but there's no frame like that. But the other way around, if you look like um, the Fallujah thing, um, which is uh, on YouTube, um, there you watch it again in the 16 by 9 frames. So if you're a cinematographer working on a 360 video where you know that it will be um, played on YouTube and Facebook and so on as well, you could think about um, how um, the image would look in the YouTube or, or Facebook frame as well. So you could should think about both mediums that will be, will be used for that. Um, and of course you have um, um, always the thing that... Be, you don't know where the audience will look at um, on the one hand, but you, I think that's something that we we'll ha have to find out that we can judge on afterwards. Of course, right now we can judge on what we see and say like that works or that doesn't for me personally. But um, in 10 years later, we will watch back and say like, okay, that's how it all evolved and got their own language and so on. So um, I would say the much you lose, the much you gain. And can you just also, I just want to recall in your mind the, especially also the the Paris, the video about Paris, there was a lot of editing, there was dramaturgy, there was rhythm, there was sound, there was not just this sound of, you know, let's get dramatic, and, and uh, there were little sounds, uh, someone, there were a lot of those little details, and that's, that's all decisions an author made, and was scripted, and yeah, so I think... I wouldn't agree. I just would well, wanted to. But I, I was focusing. I know that you can make new stories with it, and then that's beautiful. I was more thought maybe of documentary style because these th you can just put the camera there and be there, and maybe don't think about frames or you know, zooming in and zooming out. Maybe you're closer because you can just put the camera and you just be part of it. Let me add one thing I forgot about that I wanted to say. Uh, it's like, um, um, I, I think you didn't mean it like that, but in general I would say you lose nothing at all because um, it's a different medium and it's not competitive. So we will still keep the documentary style in a 16 by 9 world for cinema, for TV and so on. So um, it's, it's an addition. It's not competitive, not, not competitive at all. So um, you won't lose anything. What would you say? I, I would even say that... Um, Embrace uh, the the flaws and affordances again of the medium is like a mantra. But what I mean by this is you can't force the user to look somewhere. Yes, and that's awesome. You can reward the user for their curiosity. You can reward them for uh, thinking differently about a space. So I'm thinking about multiple examples now, and because we haven't seen them before, I don't want to confuse uh, people. But you know, you're thinking 360 video, for instance. What tells you that it's one single space? So that could be half a sphere and another half sphere in the back. You could have the, uh, there's an, a project that's called the Ark where you have people working to save the last white rhino that currently died, I think a couple of weeks back. So there is one, you know, extinct species that is now definitely extinct, but you had uh, workers protecting that rhino. And when you would turn in the other side, it was another half sphere of people working with the, uh, DNA of these rhinos to try to recreate a rhino that would be the same. So again, when I'm, we're saying it's, it's another affordance or another medium, you don't force them to look uh, somewhere, but you're taking in, 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 in account the fact that they can look in different places as part of the storytelling. So, um, and rewarding, um, every time you see an image where everything is just in one place and you turn around and nothing happens, uh, there's beautiful experiences that was showed here a couple of years back, which was called uh, the Library at Night. So a series of short pieces about libraries around the world. What about, talk about a hard to talk, like in VR, 
What's your topic? Libraries. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not Boring. the imagination that you would believe this has, but you're filming in 360 video, you would be watching a library and people acting in a library, but when you turn around, there's somebody watching wi washing windows. And I thought, this is so smart. I want to be inside this space. I'm looking around. There is somebody washing windows. I'm looking at the library and I'm being told about how that library was built. I thought it was great. So you're right. You can't force the viewer to look somewhere. You can use sound, light, storytelling, animation to kind of direct an attention. But the fact that there is no rule of where they're going to look at, I think, is an affordance. It's a, it's a plus. It depends how... It's, it's a different medium, so embrace it. I think every time a new technology is, is unleashed um, and becomes a tool for the media to use to tell stories, uh, there are people who start ringing the death knell for every other type of media ever used. When, when Leica introduced the 35mm camera in 1920-whatever, People saw this as the death of news photography. This was going to be an amateur tool. Anybody could get one and blah, blah, blah. Well, we all know how that worked out. Um, I, as, as you say, it's, it's just another tool. Um, and it, it, maybe it's not useful for everything. Maybe it is. Um, that's another debate. Um, but it's another tool in our arsenal to uh, bring stories to people. I think that was also a good word of closure. Um, thank you very much, the three of you. <laughs>